Hi, everyone. Good evening. I'm Ann Olazabel. I'm the interim dean here at the Miami Herbert Business School, and really excited to see so many of you here for the last Southern Glazers Leadership Lecture Series event. This is our last one for the year. We're very excited to have our special guest, Patrick Doyle, here. Uh, since, 2000, since January of 2023, Mr. Doyle has served as executive chairman of Restaurant Brands International, also known as RBI, here locally. It's one of the world's largest quick service restaurant companies with more than 35 billion in annual system-wide sales and over 28,000 restaurants in more than 100 countries. RBI owns four of the world's most prominent and iconic quick service restaurant brands, Tim Hortons, Burger King, Popeyes, and Firehouse Subs. Before taking on the role at RBI, Mr. Doyle served as an executive partner focused on the consumer sector of the Carlyle Group, a global diversified investment firm from September 2019 to November of 2022. Before that, he was the CEO of Domino's Pizza, which with I'm sh most of you are familiar, I would guess, between March 2010 to June 2018, and he was the president of that company from 2007 to 2010, and executive vice president of Domino's Team USA from 04 to 07, and executive vice president of Domino's Pizza International from 1999 to 2004. In other words, he was there for a long time, doing really um, important leadership roles. Like many experienced leaders, uh, Mr. Doyle also still wears many hats. Since November 2014, he served on the board of directors of Best Buy Company, Inc., and has been chairman of that board since May of 2020. He earned his MBA from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business and his BA from the University of Michigan. Please join me on the stage, and we're going to engage in what we call a fireside chat. Um, not fireside. Please, please Canal side, come on up. As you can tell from the introduction, Mr. Doyle has Patrick, been in the, please. Patrick has been in the quick service business for a long, long time, very, very experienced. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a softball here. How do you believe great brands are built and how does that differ from how they were built 20 or 30 years ago? Um, you know, it's, it, actually it's interesting because how brands are built, I think, has changed pretty dramatically um, over the course of the last uh, 30 years or so. Um, so anybody here in the packaged goods business that I should know about, okay, I see one and, okay, I'm only gonna, maybe two, I'm only gonna insult two people with this, but um, marketing was, and, and I think marketing as a discipline was largely built um, with packaged goods companies 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago, right? Coming out of World War II, there was some earlier, but it's really when, you know, with television and radio, it really is when it, it, it exploded. And it was for decades, um, the best marketers all came out of packaged goods uh, and they learned branding and marketing when it was a one-way conversation. So you're Procter & Gamble, you buy a billion dollars of television advertising a year, you, you literally create soap operas to give you a place to advertise soap, and you have a one-way conversation with consumers, um, and what you say about your brand is the truth. Fast forward to today, and brand perceptions live um, and are owned, I would tell you, by the consumer. And largely, they reside on social media. And um, I, I just fundamentally believe today that building a great brand is, is about building a differentiated product, whatever it may be, a restaurant, packaged goods, whatever it may be, you actually truly have to have a differentiated product, ideally better product, and marketing and advertising can amplify the truth, but you can't go out and build a brand around this detergent is better because it has blue dots in it. 
And I don't think the blue dots actually meant anything. I don't know that they particularly did anything, but you had this one-way conversation spending tens or hundreds of millions of dollars around the brand and whatever you said was the truth. Um, now, the truth is what's out on social media. And so you'd better actually be better and great marketing and advertising can amplify that. But it's a very different thing, I think, today than it was 30 years ago. So speaking of great marketing and advertising, you rather famously ran an ad at the beginning of 2010, just as you became CEO at Domino's, saying that your pizza wasn't very good. Yes. What on earth? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, my friend Jeff here in the front, who, uh, who ran, so our agency, um, when we did this was uh, Crispin Porter and Bogusky, started, founded in Miami. Um, and uh, uh, we, we knew we had a problem with perceptions around the quality of our pizza. And so we spent about a year and a half, told the team, I still can remember going into a room with the team and saying, anything is inbounds. You can change whatever you want. Uh, around the pizza, and, uh, and until we can do blind taste tests and beat all of our national competitors, we're not gonna launch. So it took us you know, 18 months to do that, um, and then there is the discussion about how do you launch it. And, uh, and you know, there's the standard new and improved approach, and our rather bold Miami agency um, working with our rather amazing chief marketing officer at the time, came up with this idea that, you know, we're a Midwestern company, let's just go out and tell them. And I still remember, um, so I was president, the CMO didn't even know it, I already knew I was about to become the CEO. Um, the CMO comes in and says, we want to do this spot, and we're going to talk about how bad our product was. And it's like, okay, bold. And oh, by the way, you're the one who's gonna do it. Um, and, uh, <laughs> um, and I knew, I mean, the ad launched the week that I was announced as CEO. So there was a reasonable chance that I was gonna be famous for having the shortest tenure of any CEO in American business history, um, <laughs> if it didn't work. It literally, I was announced on Monday and it launched on Monday with me in it. Um, and uh, <laughs> thankfully it worked and worked brilliantly. Uh, the interesting thing about the story is we had this whole arc figured out. So we're gonna go out and tell people how much our pizza sucks um, we'll run that for a couple of weeks, we'll get everybody's attention, and then we will go out and talk about all the wonderful things we've done with the new pizza. Um, and so you basically, advertising is about two things, right? It's about breakthrough and persuasion. Ultimate breakthrough is going out and saying our product is really bad. Um, and then we will shift to the persuasion, telling them the reason to believe that the product is better. We go out on a Monday and launch with our product really sucks. And by Wednesday, we were up double digit. And we extended the ad um, longer than originally planned um, to talk about how bad the pizza was. Um, and it ran four or five weeks. Originally, I think it was supposed to be two or three. And then we went on air with an ad talking about how great our new pizza was and our sales slowed down. And uh, the team came back and said, um, they really like it when you talk about how bad we are. And we <laughs> shot another ad that we shot and put on air like two days later of me apologizing to an individual customer. I still remember Bryce in Minnesota showing a screwed up pizza and saying, Bryce, I apologize, we're better than this. We're gonna work to make sure that everybody gets a great pizza every time. 
um, and sales go back up again. And so we kind of rolled around in it for a while. Um, and it was fascinating. I mean, it, it just, the blunt honesty in talking about how bad our product was drove incredible sales and we didn't tell them why it was better. I mean, we did eventually get some of it out, but um, we went on with the taste test. Nobody remembers this. We had, because we had done taste tests, we knew that our product was better than Pizza Hut and Papa John's. We go on with the taste test claim and talk about how we're better, and which we thought was like going to be the pinnacle of this whole thing. And consumers hate it. It's like now you're just being an arrogant big brand like everybody else, putting down, you know, your competitors. Nope, go back to talking about how bad you are, and we'd go back and sales would go up again. It was really remarkable. And the stunning thing to me is that was, you know, that was January of 2010. So we are 13 years later, and nobody else has done it. And I'm, I, it's stunning to me. And frankly, I don't want to get into this world, but I'm really stunned that a politician hasn't done it. Right? And go out and say, I'm a part of the mess that's existed in DC. It's a disaster. I own it. I've been part of it. And I'm committed to doing the right thing going forward. And nobody, nobody's got the guts to do it. It's amazing to me. Well, and how do you, but how do you sustain the we're bad message? I mean, eventually, and the sales that come eventually along with it. we moved on. <laughs> I was going to um, say. But we came up with new things. And, um, and we started talking about ourselves at Domino's um, as being a work in progress agency, or agency, work in progress brand. And then there was a spin out of an agency from Crispin who now has the business called Work in Progress. They named their agency after it. Um, and that was um, our, our whole attitude was we are never going to go out and declare that we are great. We're going to go out and declare that we've always got things to work on. We are always going to try to get better. This is the newest thing that we've done to try to improve and get better for you. I love that. That's great. Uh, Domino, Domino's then eventually became known as a brand that used digital assets and technology to sort of meaningfully disrupt, if you will, um, earlier than others did in the restaurant industry. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so th I mean that really became the story. And um, so the bump that we got from fixing the food, from fixing the pizza, drove amazing results for a couple of years. And frankly, it gave us, as a public company, it gave us the room to invest tons um, in technology at a time when technology was really not front and center at all in the restaurant industry. We had a huge advantage um, as a delivery pizza company, which was um, our customers were already used to ordering ahead. So we just needed to move them from the phone to originally their computer, then their device, then like everywhere. We came up with ways to order kind of any, anywhere where there was a screen you could order. Um, but it really transformed the business. I mean, we went from a phone-based uh, ordering business to a digital business, far more efficient, higher tickets, um, gave us all of the data so we could remarket um, to them. I mean, it was, it was spectacular for our business in every way and much happier customers. Tell me a little bit about the rollout of the technology. I mean, you talk about how, how that had such a great effect on, on your yeah. ability to, go ahead. Yeah, well, um, first of all, uh, <laughs> I still remember talking to the board about it when we decided we're gonna bring all the technology in house there just isn't a great solution out there today that we can get off the shelf. So we need to do it ourselves. And uh, they said, you know, how much is it gonna cost? And I said, it's gonna be 20 million um, spread over two years. So figure 10 million a year for two years. That's what the team has told me. We all know the joke on technology. It's harder and more expensive 
So figure it's going to be 25, worst case, 30 million. That's what I sold the board with. Um, fast forward about four or five years, we were spending $100 million a year. Um, I was completely wrong. Um, fortunately, the return on investment was extraordinary um, on, uh, on the resources we were putting into it, um, but wildly uh, underestimated uh, the cost, how hard it would be. Um, it was, you know, it was not easy, but the return on investment was unbelievable. Word to the wise. Um, so looking back at your time in Domino's, because I want to move, I, I do want to move forward and talk a little bit yep. about RBI. Looking back uh, at your time at Domino's, is there anything you'd have done differently? Yeah. Um, uh, I, yeah, I, so first of all, um, <laughs> I think this is always the case. Everybody would say move faster. I would say move faster than we did. Um, but uh, I think the other thing is um, we added too many things to our menu. We complicated our restaurants. Um, you know, it, if you look at the best businesses in the restaurant industry, they are generally pretty focused menus. Um, and I think we expanded it too much. Um, and if I had a do-over, I would probably scale that back a bit. Anything else? Oh, boy. Well, you know, it took us a while to get our, our restaurants looking better also. Um, and, uh, and we had underestimated as a predominantly delivery company the value of prominent, great-looking real estate because it's like, well, people are ordering from their homes. It doesn't matter, and the answer is it does matter. People want to know that even if they never step foot, they want to drive by it, know where it is, see that it's clean and well-lit, and... Um, and so I, I think we could have moved on our, on our real estate faster than we did as well. Interesting, interesting. So, so now you're the executive chair at Restaurant Brands. Uh, as I said a moment ago, Burger King, Tim Hortons, Popeyes, Firehouse Subs. Um, what are the similarities and differences between, uh, what you in, between these and what you encountered at Domino's? Yeah, so the restaurant business is the restaurant business. You know, I would tell you that 80% of it in each of the businesses looks very, very familiar. Um, the businesses, and four brands, but really five um, business units. So it's the four brands for the US and Canada, and then an international business for all four of them run from Switzerland. And they're just in very different places. and. So the challenges on each of them are very, very different. So the biggest business actually is, is Tim Hortons. Um, Tim Hortons out of Canada is, it is the single most beloved brand in the restaurant industry, in its home market, on the planet. The only thing that is close to it is Jollibee in the Philippines. Um, I mean, it is, think about a brand that with no sense of irony uses their own flag as the logo, right? It is the red maple leaf is the logo of Tim Hortons. It is so intertwined with the national identity in Canada, it's extraordinary. 80% of Canadians have eaten at a Tim Hortons in the last 30 days. We have millions of customers who buy from us multiple times a day. The wow. frequency is incredible. When the Canadian government was trying to distribute masks at the beginning of COVID, they approached Tim Hortons and said, can we ship you cases and pallets and pallets of masks to pass out to all of the Canadians? Nobody in the US government would think about approaching a restaurant company to be part of their medical solution um, at the beginning of a pandemic in Canada, it is completely logical that you would do that, right? Biggest distribution of any outlet, of any retailer in the country. And uh, so incredible business there. Um, the international business is booming, growing fast. It's huge. Um, Popeyes is amazing, amazing chicken, growing quickly. 
Um, we've got to get faster and get more efficient in the restaurants. Fire, firehouse is new and growing. Um, just we need to scale it. And then Burger King in the US um, on a very good path, um, but a little bit of a fixer upper. We've got, some, we've got some work to do on the Burger King business in the US. Outside of the US, it's amazing. Inside the US on a good path, um, but we've got some work to do on that one. So you, you left Domino's and you spent some time in the investment world. Yep. Uh, what made you want to come back to the, to the quick service industry? Yeah, I, I was already moving to Miami um, and I love it. I had looked at buying some other concepts when I kind of affiliated with Carlisle. Um, didn't wind up getting any of them. Um, and uh, I've known the, the folks, a um, couple of the folks on the board for a while. Uh, they knew I was building, you know, my wife and I were building a place down here. And they said, when are you, when are you in Miami next? Let's have dinner. And, uh, and over dinner, like, you know, it, it was interesting because Daniel and Alex, Daniel um, was, okay, here to hear all the numbers and the analytics and what this could mean for you. And, you know, and really getting into all the specifics. And Alex, um, a super charismatic guy, and he's just like, come on, you're moving to Miami. You know the restaurant industry. I mean, come on, just come on. <laughs> and that was a sales pitch. It's like, just get back in, do it. And, uh, and I, you know, and I started looking at the businesses and the brands, and I just became enamored and finally decided, you know what, I got to do it. But it's a different role, right? So you were CEO. Very much. Uh, you know, t talk to, especially our students, talk a little bit about the differences. I mean, you're a, you're a CEO at Domino's. You've got tons of experience in quick service. You've done some great stuff with marketing. You've de developed a great brand. And you take a little bit of time off to do something different. You come back now into the quick service industry as chairman of the board. Right. Very right. different, yeah. right? Very, very different. So, and I'm, so I, I you know, I chair the board at, at Best Buy, but it's a normal non-executive chair role. So I run the board, right? And, um, and, you know, and coach the CEO, who by the way, she's amazing, one of the best CEOs in the country, Corey Berry, like unbelievable. Um, and, uh, but here it's different because I'm exec chair. So I am technically an employee. Um, and uh, so I'm in the office a lot. Um, we have a new CEO, Josh Kobza, who's incredible. Um, he is 36. Um, if, so we are technically headquartered in Toronto. Um, so we kind of are run from Toronto and Miami. Um, because um, we are a Canadian domicile business, we are not eligible for the Fortune 500 list. If we were, we'd be a Fortune 100 company. He would be the youngest CEO of a Fortune 500 company, um, period. Um, not even any of the tech companies are, are uh, run by folks younger than him now. So he's amazing, but it's, it's a terrific partnership. I love Josh. He's incredibly smart. He was CFO. He was COO. He's run technology there. Um, but, you know, I'm the guy who's done a lot of this stuff. He's the hard-charging younger guy who's, you know, he can do a lot more of the travel than I can do at this point. Um, and, uh, and so I can coach him. I can coach the five business heads, help with some strategy things. I'm still learning, you know, the various businesses. But he's the guy, day in and day out. He's the person, and really particularly, it's the five business unit presidents who are, are running their respective businesses. And um, it's terrific. But at the end of the day, Josh is the CEO, right? And so I'm there as mentor and coach, and I run the board. Um, we had a board meeting yesterday in Toronto. Um, and uh, But it is a different role. And I will tell you, chairman, non-exec chair roles, pretty well defined. CEO roles, very defined exec chair roles all over the board. There are some that are very involved, some that are in there 80 hours a week, some that are way less, so very, 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 very different depending on the company. So Josh has got his hands full. I mean, you, you've, got, you've got some of the most <laughs> recognized brands in the world, but you're in an incredibly competitive industry. Yep. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yes. How does RBA maintain its edge? 
Yeah, so, you know, I'll go back to how great brands are built. The answer is do the right thing, right? Do, make, make, <laughs> make great food, make it affordable, do it in beautiful restaurants, do it with a smile, um, you know, then run great advertising to kind of amplify that. But it really is, is no harder than that. You look at the businesses and say, what are we doing well? What are we doing poorly? How can we get better? And importantly, because we are almost completely a franchise business. So we've got these franchisees who are our partners. They put their capital and their time and resources in. Um, how do we generate a great economic model for them um, as the owners of the restaurants? And we have very purposefully put uh, the owners and, and their economics as being the single most important metric for us as the company. Seems like it's working, right? Uh, so take, I'm gonna switch gears to here just a little bit to talk about fast food in general or what I think you prefer to call quick service yeah, restaurants. Fast food works. Um, <laughs> it looks like there's a, a, a real rise in demand for healthier food options. Yep. Um, so how are, how is RBI and it's, how are the brands addressing this trend? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating because, um, there are, it's really been interesting to watch and I was watching it from kind of the outside looking at investments. I looked at one or two kind of in the healthier space and you don't have, um, a national scale player today entirely focused on kind of healthier options. Um, where most of the healthier food is sold today is in existing chains. And, um, and it's done differently across the chains. Um, so, you know, probably the biggest, most prominent today that is focused entirely on it is Sweetgreen. And they've got a couple hundred units. Um, and it's pretty high ticket. So they're at it. They're they're looking at a pretty rarefied demographic today. That that you know that that's going to work for them. Um, so Burger King, we've got the Impossible Burger. Outside of the U.S., it's interesting. Outside of the U.S., um, it's not the Impossible Burger, but we have at Burger King the option and. <laughs> A lot of the restaurants outside of the U.S. are, are unless it's a drive-through, fundamentally 100% digital. You go in, there are kiosks there, that's where you order, and you go in and you start to order a burger or a chicken sandwich or whatever it may be, and you've got an option as you're ordering that just says make it veg. And you can convert anything into veg. Um, and uh, it depends on the country. Some of those are you know, mid single digit sales, some of them are much, much higher than that. And so, you know, I think there is room for somebody to grow significantly just focused on that. Um, you know, there's a great local one, Puerto Vida, right? That, that does a terrific job. Um, but I think they've got 15 or 20 units. And it's, and like you said, it's a high price and point. And it's a high price point. Right? And so, you know, look, if you're really going to scale healthier eating, I think it's going to come from the players that already have the footprint. And it's really going to be based on demand. Um, more than, you know, kind of putting it forward, you make it very available and you let people choose. There is a term that I've heard more in, in Europe than I've heard in here called flexitarians. Right? And it is people who are not vegetarians but they want to eat more that way. And so it is an option that they want to have, and they've reduced you know, their, their eating fried food or eating red meat or whatever, and they drift that way. Um, and it's just, it's interesting because um, you know, we'll see, but my bet is you're gonna see it more happen within existing chains than necessarily somebody getting really, really big that is 100% focused on that. And it's not going to happen at Tim Hortons. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got healthy options at Tim's, but, you what, know, it starts as option? coffee and, and donuts. So, you know, <laughs> it's a good morning option. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears again. And, and, and I want to talk about challenges associated with 
operating internationally, yep. right? So you talked earlier about what your, your pretty big presence internationally with your brands. Yep. Um, outside of Canada, which is you know fairly familiar to us and fairly similar to what we're used to, talk talk to me about Turkey or yeah. India or somewhere yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, we have a terrific Burger King business in Turkey, Popeye's business. I mean, I think we've got something like, I want to say 800 Burger Kings in Turkey. I mean, it's a great business. Um, and, you know, look, the, the, the great thing about our, our products is they generally adapt incredibly well into the local markets. And typically you have um, twists on the favorites. Um, from my old life at Domino's, it was really easy. You know, the, the crust, the sauce, the cheese, same everywhere, put on whatever toppings are local. And there'd be kind of the old favorites, but you go to India, India is the largest in terms of restaurant counts, largest Domino's business outside of the US. I think they're up to 16, 1700 restaurants now in India, maybe even a little bit more. Um, and it, you know, a lot of a lot of people who are only going to eat veg, really simple, to make it veg on a on a pizza. Just those are the toppings you choose. Something so, unique in India that they put um, on their oh pizza. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, we we've got you know we've got lots of paneer options and different you know tikka chickens and yeah, I mean, so it's lots of lots of choices that are that are very localized. So those are both positive stories. I'm interested in hearing about some of the real challenges in operating yeah. internationally. Um, well, I'll give them my favorites. So when Domino's first went into China, um, as a delivered pizza company, um, probably entered 25, 30 years ago. Um, and if, you know, income levels at that point much lower than they are today in China, if people were going to spend the money on prepared food, they wanted to go into a restaurant, experience the restaurant, it was a, you know, and KFC got it early, um, and they still have the biggest business of, of anybody in the industry in China. Um, but it was very much about a sit-down restaurant business. Um, and we were a delivery business, problem one. Problem number two was roughly half of the Chinese population 30 years ago believed that they were lactose intolerant. And we sell a product with a bunch of cheese on it. So as a pizza delivery company, other than the fact that half of the population thought our product made them sick and they didn't want delivery, great idea, right? <laughs> and we flailed around there for years, a couple decades. And all of a sudden, we pop our heads up and we've built restaurants with 200 seats and we've got rice-based dishes and all the rest of it and I don't know what the hell we were, right? And we're there and we're looking and there are like these KFC scooters going by and McDonald's scooters going by doing delivery. We're like, what's going on? All of a sudden delivery, as income levels have gone up, as two income families, which is a great predictor of restaurant occasions. Um, so if you've got two people in the family working, the convenience of restaurants gets far, far more, more relevant. So and delivery is becoming a really good option now and income levels are going up. So the market moved to us um, and all of a sudden it, you know, it, it got really interesting. But like I can tell you from, from RBI and, and around the world and from my Domino's days, the single most important thing is you've got to find the right partner in the market. You've got to have a great partner who knows the market, knows local tastes, can deal with all the intricacies of the business. We can teach them how to make great food, how to find real estate, though that may even differ locally. Um, but it's, you know, it uh, it is success and failure is 80% about finding the right partners. So here's kind of a forward-looking question, and, and I don't know if there's an answer to this. How is AI going to affect fast food? Or is it? Yeah, it probably it probably will. So, um, and there are a few ways to look at it. So, um, one is, uh, and and you know, AI is really broad. So you can think about machine learning. You can think about kind of the chat bot stuff happening. Um, you know, 
it, it is, it, it's kind of all getting blended together into one big amalgamation right now. Mach machine learning is about, you know, if, if you're driving up to a drive-through and we've got a plate reader or you've got the app on your phone open so that we know who you are when you drive in. Great machine learning will mean that we can serve up different options on that board and make it an easier, quicker um, experience for you to order, right? And, um, and you know, machine learning means you're gonna get smarter and smarter and smarter about that. So that's really about kind of the data science part of it. What's become really popular to talk about recently are kind of the, you know, what you can do with that written and verbally. And look, you can, you can see how tasks um, in the restaurants can start to be converted to using the labor in restaurants in different ways um, as, you know, maybe the ability to voice order or whatever it may be can be done more digitally. Um, I, my, my one prediction, and I've had this for a while, um, and I've been wrong to date, um, but I believe strongly that in 10 years, we are gonna look back on the decade where we were all walking around with our heads down, thumbing things into a little screen as being crazy. This is not a great interface, right? The best interface is voice, right? Ultimately, I think you're gonna see people interacting with their technology in a different way than they do it today. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and so the kiosks that are in restaurants, the ordering ahead, all of that, my bet is that that shifts over time um, to, uh, to more voice based. And I just, you, you just, you, you look around, if you look around people walking around this campus, walking with their heads down and their thumbs working away and not looking up, it's weird, right? I mean, it just, I don't think you're gonna see that 10 years from now. I think you're gonna see better interfaces with technology than, than people are using today. But I've been wrong for a while on that. Been predicting that a while. F fewer employees? No, I think you're just gonna see more efficiency. So, you know, what it means is, is um, you know, you can move people more to, to hospitality, you can move people more into the, the you know, actually crafting the food. Um, there are just ways, I don't, you know, look, can it make it more efficient? I think what it means is that you can grow maybe more in the restaurant with ne without necessarily adding more. Um, but I, I don't know that it dramatically changes um, the amount of labor being used in the restaurant industry. So, And I can tell you, it, the use of digital at Domino's didn't do that. The fact that people order ahead, it changed how labor was used. It didn't reduce labor. Great. <clears throat> so RBI is actually known for its really strong corporate culture. Um, one of the best employers in Canada, named in 2020 by Forbes. Um, it's also been recognized for its commitment to diversity and inclusion with um, awards such as the Human Rights Campaign's best, best, best Place to Work for LGBTQ Equality and the Women's Choice Award for Best Companies for Women. How did they get there? And um, you know, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, so first of all, I've only been here a few months, so I can't tell you as, as much about the, the history of how we got here, but we're proud of, of who we are as an organization. Look, at the end of the day, I'll, I'll, I'll answer, the, there are kind of two answers to, to the question that you asked. So how do you become inclusive in your culture? And you know, look, at, at the end of the day, the, the, the days of businesses being run, tapping a very limited, talent pool, it just doesn't make any sense. So it's, you know, not only is it the right thing to do, but it's also the right thing to do, right? I mean, it, you know, it, it not only is, you know, do you look at it and say, this is what we should be doing as an organization, but it is crazy that businesses have been built 
you know, in the past on kind of an exclusionary model, right? So you've got to, you know, have diversity and access diverse talent into your, into your company and make them feel welcome and do the things that you need to do um, to, to kind of strengthen your organization that way. So, uh, you know, with everything, there's a lot of discussion around, you know, around ESG in the business world and the investing world. And the interesting thing to me about it is that 90, 95% of the time, the right thing to do is also the right thing to do for shareholders, right? And so th there's a lot of discussion around conflict around it. I just never view it as a conflict. It's the right thing to do, right? And sustainability on, 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 you know, on inclusion in your workforce, on all of these things, it's, it, you know, it, it, there's a return for shareholders as well as being the right thing. The other part of, of the culture that I think is, is unique and special at RBI um, is it is a place that has very purposefully gone out and hired the best and brightest young, brought them in, given them ownership in the business very early on, um, work hard, uh, achieve a lot, take risks. Um, I, you know, I'll tell you, I walk around the office here and I always particularly notice it when I'm in the, uh, the cafeteria, which has our brands in there and other options as well. Um, and I look around that room and everybody in there, and it is um, number one, incredibly diverse in there. You're generally gonna hear 10, 12, 15 languages being spoken in there, um, and it's very young. I mean, I walk in the room, I raise the average age noticeably. Um, I when feel I, you, when I, I feel you. <laughs> I work at a university, right? <laughs> So here's another question. The restaurant industry is notoriously difficult to break into for uh, small business owners. Do you have advice for um, any budding entrepreneurs in the audience? Yeah, become a franchisee. <laughs> Did you hear that? Yeah, I mean, it, look, there, there are, the next great concept is out there. Um, they are, there always are new concepts, but from an expected outcome standpoint, um, failure rates on franchise businesses are dramatically lower than startup restaurants. And usually startup restaurants are done by people who have not been in the restaurant industry. Um, and there are things that you need to learn um, along the way and being part of a system where not only the company and the support that we provide, but frankly being with peers um, and learning the systems around it and then getting really good at operating in your local environments, um, hiring locally, being part of your, you know, your neighborhood or your town or your city, um, you know, and, and doing it as that local owner operator. Um, that's, I mean, uh, to be the path to success um, the, the, the easiest path to success and the most predictable path to success is through franchising and has been for a very, very long time. It's tough being, you know, a startup. You know, we've got a great example right here in the front table, um, you know, with, with Churros Mania, but that's rare, you know, and it was rare when, you know, Macklemore started Burger King and it's, you know, rare when Al Copeland started Popeyes and, you know, and the Sorensen brothers started Firehouse and Tim Horton um, started Tim Hortons. Spent a lot of time on the name. Um, you know, but it, th that's rare. Yeah, yeah. So we've got a lot of, as you know, we've got a lot of students in the audience, both undergraduate and graduate. Yep. I know there's some alums out there, so shout out to you too. But I was hoping that Patrick could give our undergraduates some advice on how to really maximize their potential for success in the early part of their careers. Yeah, so, um, you know, it, it's, it's a few things. I mean, you know, the, clearly the obvious things around, you know, learning and always be learning and asking tons of questions and working really hard and all those sorts of things. Um, what I have found, and, and it, it is, you know, I probably got bias in my answer because it was kind of how I managed my own career, but... Um, I, I watch people who are successful 
and I think this holds pretty true. Um, find things that are broken and fix them, and you will be noticed. Um, and in a lot of organizations, I see people trying to move into the areas that are doing really well, and by being there, I will associate myself with success and learn from people who are doing it very well. It is very hard to differentiate yourself as talent by working in the area of the company that's going really, really well. It is far easier to be the person who always raises their hand for, see that grubby thing over in the corner over there? Let me, let me go take a swing at that. Let me see if I can fix that. And early in your career, if it's the thing nobody else has wanted to go after, you are far more likely to get a yes, sure, young person, go try and fix that. You know, And you do that repeatedly, and you're not only showing that you're kind of a go-getter, um, but you're going to distinguish yourself. I mean, people are going to notice, wow, this person like three times in a row has gone in to fix something that wasn't going well. And as opposed to being the you know, 20th person in the marketing department that's doing a great job. And you know, it's, it's hard to kind of distinguish yourself that way. So that sent me on a very weird career path. I mean, I started in finance and then I went to a little startup medical device business where I was largely doing sales and a little bit of, of, of manufacturing and then I joined Gerber and you know I was doing kind of international development and then I ran Canada which was kind of sales and marketing and then they brought me back to the US as to run, I was general manager of baby food in the US but it was basically a marketing job and I got recruited from there into Domino's as a marketing guy and I really didn't, Jeff, I didn't know a damn thing about marketing. Um, and you know, and I and so now I'm a marketing guy, and then I ran restaurants, our corporate restaurants there, which hadn't been doing very well. I mean, I did like anything that looked broken, I'd jump into it. And I think fundamentally there are two career paths for people. Um, one is I'm gonna I'm gonna go into the finance area, and I'm gonna be the best possible finance or accounting person and I'm going to work up through there and you know, ideally become CFO one day, um, or I'm going to be the generalist and I'm going to go all over the place, clearly what I did. I mean, I have done almost everything um, in my career and I'm never close to being the best at any of those things. I wound up doing this because I'm, you know, like at least a B minus at everything and you put it all together and you know I know a lot about everything so I know how value gets created by bringing it all together and that's I think generally how people run their careers I'm a big fan of the jumping around thing finding things that are broken creating value and getting yourself noticed that way what about our graduate students I mean would would your advice be different for those who've stopped out come to school full-time and are looking to go back into the workforce no. Same thing, fix problems. Fix problems, fix problems. And the, and the one other thing that I would say um, is, uh, is early in your career, your value is in what you can do. And somewhere plus or minus 30 years old, um, your, your value in an organization becomes about how you lead. And learn that um, as early as you can, it's a very different skill set. You know, the person who is the best at, at running, you know, or, or doing accounting or, 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 you know, creating advertising or whatever it may be, um, that's great to be the doer, um, but there is a point at which you now have to lead a group of those people doing that, and it's a different skill set. Um, and, you know, getting an MBA uh, to me is often about building that skill set, building the leadership skill set. You know, if you're undergraduate business, often it's about learning the skills. 
Um, if you're 30 years old and getting your MBA, I think you want to focus a lot on developing those leadership skills and, and learning people skills and how you do that effectively. Terrific. So um, I'd love to ask you about the grubby little things you fixed, but I think that's going to have to be another day <laughs> because I, I was hoping that you'd take one or two questions from the audience. Oh, of course. Would you mind? Of course. Hello, uh, my name is Ben Devolve. I'm a freshman. Uh, one of my good friends is a senior and he's going to RBI at a rotational awesome. program here. So, uh, so my question was about kind of the economic Tell pressures. Tell him to fix some things. Yeah. I can give him <laughs> a will. list if he wants I'll it. give him your advice, I will. <laughs> um, so one of my questions is about the economic pressures that are kind of facing the, the average consumer right now and kind of how RBI intends to kind of continue the quality but also at that price that you were talking about at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. So. Um, I have the advantage of being, you know, old, um, or at least older, um, and I've seen inflation before. You've never seen inflation um, unless you live somewhere else in the world, right? I mean, literally, it's been 30, 40 years since we had significant inflation in the U.S. Um, if you are old enough, um, you know, you've seen it before. And um, mostly I just look at it, at it as an opportunity, right? Because everybody has to figure out how to take pricing. Um, everybody has to figure out how to get a little bit more efficient. Um, and the people who are smart and good at it are gonna create some competitive advantage by doing it better than the people who are bad at it. Um, and, you know, and I can give you some examples, right? The, um, we've got amazing um, pricing teams, analytic teams um, within each of the businesses. And the most obvious thing to do um, is coffee prices go up, so let's increase the price of coffee. And the answer may be, that may be, if somebody is getting their morning cup of coffee at Tim's in Canada, they may be very price sensitive about that cup of coffee. The right thing to do may be actually to take some price somewhere else. Or it may be to reduce the amount of discounting that you're doing, which may be less visible than increasing menu prices. And there are lots of ways to test that. Um, we do that very well. Um, and there are people and companies that don't. Um, and so to me, it's, a, it's an opportunity um, to, you know, to put great analytical skills to work um, and to do it in a way that's hopefully smarter than the competition is doing and create some advantage that way. Thank you. Who else? Hi, uh, thank you, Patrick, for um, speaking to UM students and me as an alumni and current um, employee at RBI. <laughs> um, my question revolves around, you talked about how we have four really distinct brands excluding our international presence and how that can be challenging. Yep. But can you provide some examples of how we leverage those brands to improve services or capabilities at others and how that really allows us to expedite our big bets in the future? Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting because one of the things we're trying to do um, right now is to be far more thoughtful about what is in RBI and what is in the business units. Um, and in general, that's probably going to be less RBI, more business units. Um, I think we were a little too centralized on some things. The risk in doing that is not having enough sharing across the brands. Um, but I can tell you we did work on coffee at Burger King not too long ago, and we brought in the Tim's team who, you know, we own our own roasteries, we've got experts that are sourcing, you know, coffee from Central America and from Colombia and from, from Indonesia, and, um, you know, we can, learn from the other brands and the other businesses. We are really good at analytics um, at Tim Hortons. Um, and we're getting better in some of the others, but we can bring 
you know, the learning from some of those folks over to the other brands. You know, what we're trying to do is to figure out the right balance on, you know, what is prescriptive from RBI, um, which in some cases may be more efficient, but we're leaning, I think, far more towards let's be effective, let's, let's give more resources into the individual business units so that they can move faster, the decisions are made there, um, but at the same time, figure out how do you share learnings because somebody's figured something out, then we've got to move it into the other businesses quickly. So I think we have time for one more. Yeah, yeah my question is, uh, what do you prefer? Multi-unit franchisees or single franchisees? <laughs> and what is the difference and why? Yeah, so, um, it's interesting. So we, we, and we have very different models. Um, first of all, international. Um, generally, we have a master franchisee, so somebody has the rights for a brand in the whole country. Um, and so we've got folks that own a thousand restaurants in France or in Spain. Um, Tim Hortons and Firehouse, very small franchisees. Lots of single unit owners, average at Tim's is four, average at Firehouse, I think is about two and a half restaurants per owner. Um, Burger King in the US, we have some much bigger ones. So the first answer is, I love them all. Um, I want them all to succeed. It is generally harder to be a very large franchisee and drive the same level of success on average as a smaller owner operator does, but there are notable exceptions to that. And you know, where I start from in a franchise business is why do you have franchisees? Um, and it's kind of unique to um, the restaurant industry that there are so many franchisees. And often when a company, a concept gets started, it's because of capital. I've started, you know, I'm, I'm Macklemore, I've started um, Burger King. I don't have the capital to build hundreds of Burger Kings, so I find franchisees to do it. Over time, as the brand gets bigger, you've got the capital. The reason you wind up doing it is because in general, you believe strongly, and I believe strongly, that a local owner operator is probably gonna run those restaurants on average better if, than if we were trying to do it all corporately. And it is, if, if you've got a very large franchisee, at some point they wind up looking more like a corporate operator than a franchise operator. But there are notable exceptions, right? I mean, the largest franchisee in, in, in uh, Burger King in the US is Carol's, it's publicly traded. On average, they've grown sales faster than our system average over time. And they're, they're the single biggest and it's a thousand units. Right, so you know it, it, it can be done. Um, but I think often it is easier to do it with the local owner operator. Terrific, well, will you please join me in thanking Patrick Doyle for his time tonight. Thank you.